We're now entering the fourth week of compounding bad news for the government. As each stuff-up is revealed and the more time the Prime Minister spends explaining away the stuff-ups, the less pu- the public has confidence in their ability to manage the pandemic. The past four weeks have exposed the government and their PR messaging and slogans as just that. PR and slogans. Scratch the surface and the facts are laid bare and they aren't pretty. As more and more people find out that the health response was more good luck than good management, the angrier they get. When they lose their jobs and businesses as a result of that mismanagement, they'll get even angrier. No amount of slogans and weasel words can undo the damage being done because the government has employed a disaster of an elimination strategy that was always doomed to fail. Calling a virus tricky as some sort of labelling and blame-sharing device is just lame. The simple facts, as you will soon hear, is that the government had that failed to deliver affordable houses under their B- Kiwi Build scheme, and the government that failed to build light rail to the airport is the same government now failing at the border. It really shouldn't be a surprise. I'm Cam Slater, and this is Insight Politics. Just yesterday, the government was caught again with a major stuff-up after social media posts were sent out asking people in South Auckland and West Auckland to go and get tested. It turns out, according to the Prime Minister, that the ask was wrong, that the messaging of the ask was wrong, and that she was really very angry. Check out this. Why why was the call put out last night um, online for West Aucklanders with no symptoms to get tested? Um, I put that down to, I was made aware of that this morning, Uh, I would put that down to oversimplified communication. That is not the ask coming from health officials currently. As I set out, um, our ask is if you have cold symptoms, get a test. If you have flu symptoms, get a test. And of course, if you have any connection to those involved in this cluster, we have been asking also um, people to get a test. what I, from what I understand of that message that has gone out, um, the detail within the message was correct. Some of the top line headings were simply oversimplified and they were wrong. That's a pretty big... unnecessary yeah. panic by that miscommunication? It's wrong. It was over, oversimplified and we're working very hard now to deal with um, uh, what that's created with the community uh, and uh, making sure that, of course, we're correcting that. And within, I'm told, I haven't seen it, but within the message itself, I'm told the details were correct. The top line messaging was simply oversimplified and it was incorrect. Uh, So we will keep correcting that. Essentially, the messaging we've been putting out still stands. We'll be working with the Ministry of Education, Health and others to make sure where there are concerns that we're addressing those as quickly as we can. We've also, as I understand, the All of Government Group has gone out to media outlets to help support the correction of that messaging as well. What, what has that messaging caused in the community? Well, I can tell you, for me, it's caused me to be incredibly angry. We have to be very clear in our communication. We have to be very direct in our asks. And you'll see that in a very dynamic environment, by and large, we're able to be very, very consistent. I think ultimately what's happened here is that there's been an attempt to keep a message simple, and it's just been done badly. What's it, what's it caused in the community then? Why does it make you angry? Like what, what's... Because it's made an ask that was not correct. We are not asking every single person in West and South Auckland to get a test. That is not our ask. That's not what we're encouraging. We're asking people who have cold symptoms, who have flu symptoms, um, and if they have any connection to the cases that we are currently very focused on, those are the individuals we want tested. We do have um, asymptomatic testing uh, that is going on in certain environments, and we will keep that up, but we are not asking over 700,000 New Zealanders to get a test uh, without reason at this point in time. Have you anyway demonstrated this concern around getting people, enough people to these testing stations? No, is... no, no, it was a mistake. Um, so no, it's not about that at all. In fact, yesterday, on a day where traditionally we tend to have lower numbers, um, we had um, uh, very good solid numbers at that 10,000 mark. So no, it's not a demonstration of that at all. Apologise for this. It seems like there's been a lot of confusion around something because, I mean, it's a pretty critical mistake. Jason, the Herald can certainly help us with this issue. We do need to make sure that we get that correct messaging out and we will keep 
asking for that support. I'm working very hard to establish what happened here because we do need to make sure our messages are nice and clear. It, I mean, by your own admission, it was a mistake and you only heard about it this morning when it went out um, yesterday. So surely there needs to be some sort of apology. So one of the issues we have, of course, is that not all of the comms is individually signed off by me. Um, there need to be processes in place that make sure that we have those who are, of course, very deeply embedded in all of the messaging we're asking, particularly from a health perspective, to make sure they're totally involved in the process for signing off communication to make sure we don't have the oversimplification of messaging because that's what's happened here. So, there's been, so, so this has been work to make sure this never happens again? Oh, that has to be the case. That's my expectation. I've made my views very, very clear um, with those in, involved today about what my expectations are because we, we just can't afford um, to have messages like that go out incorrectly. If it, if it was a oh, yeah, stations. Yeah, who signed off on the communication? So the Unite Against COVID-19 is run through the All of Government group. Um, so essentially that's who I'll be working with to make sure that we don't have anything like this happen again. It is a separate process. Of course, there's been previously issues have been raised around making sure it's a completely apolitical process. Does it involve... Um, uh, particularly in this period of time. It's very strictly and tightly kept within officials groups. So we will be making sure though, that within that, the processes are in place to make sure it's checked by everyone who needs to check it. People, people in, in South and West Auckland. Um, I'll, just, I'll just camp around anyone who hasn't taken a question. Do, do, yeah. do you, say, you say today you're angry, it's a mistake. Why didn't you front foot it then today in your, in your statement before the questions and say, look, this was an error, this was a mistake? Oh, well, look, it's, I certainly knew I'd have that opportunity in questions and I've set out what our testing regime um, is. Uh, so it's very, very clear on what I've said today, what our expectations are, and I had every anticipation that you'd give me a chance to then talk about the incorrect comms. It's always a lying call in restating a mistake, you amplify it. I want to make sure that people hear very clearly what our ask is of them. It is that if you have cold and flu symptoms or if you're connected to any of these cases, that's where we need testing. And have you gone to the health minister and gone, look, we need to figure this out, had talks to try and see I've who's I've been doing that since this morning, so you can rest assured we will get to the bottom of that. But actually the most important thing is what we tell people now. When did the message go out? I mean, you, you say it's on the onus for the media companies to correct it. Did you go to no, them no, personally? I'm asking for your support to correct it. Oh, sure. No, no support. because ultimately you've told a story around a piece of comms that we need to correct. Right. But did you go proactively to some of the major news sites and say, this is wrong? Or did you wait for this opportunity no, um, now to do so, it? Uh, earlier today, I, on a phone call with the All of Government group, I asked them to very proactively make sure that they were, as a team, going in and contacting those who were reporting on it to make sure that they were utterly clear on what the actual ask is. Um, and also, from this morning, I've been working on the processes that are in place that allowed this situation to happen to make sure we can correct that too. Any concern that testing stations might be overloaded as a result of this? Not that I've had reported to me, and I'm sure, again, if we can get that message out nice and clearly, and again, you're see, as I understand it, and I haven't seen the piece of communication, but as I, I have asked how far and wide it's gone and on what um, channels it was shared, but as it's been explained to me, the information within the body was correct, it was simply the headline that wasn't. People in, in South and West Auckland are being asked to get tested. Are they also expected to self-isolate until they get their, their test results back if they are uh, So, of course, again, just we're not asking everyone in Western South Auckland to do a blanket test. Quite apart from her appalling grammar and overuse of the word ask, the Prime Minister has presided over yet another stuff-up. But she absolutely refused to apologise, instead chucking health comms staff under the bus. This is not a Prime Minister who likes to be held to account. The insistent questioning from Jason Walls at the New Zealand Herald was some of the hardest questioning she has ever received. She very quickly handed over questions to the health spokesperson from the Ministry. Despite all her assurances that it was wrong, the journalist pointed out that the messages were all still live on Facebook and Twitter. That was one press conference that went south on the Prime Minister and she wasn't happy about it at all. Sadly, this is now becoming routine now that the media have realised that the government aren't actually the one source of truth they claim to be and in many cases have been caught outright lying to us all. These stuff-ups can't continue without the government taking a hit in the polls. The government has been at pains to move to mass masking. They'd been softening us up before the latest lockdown in Auckland, 
and all of a sudden talking about masks and how effective they were in stopping the spread of the Chinese plague. Daring to question them and their softening up approach led to the branding of naysayers as COVID deniers. But the fact remains that during the first lockdown, the government and their mouthpieces were telling us masks were next to useless. This was Dr Ashley Bloomfield at the time. You can use a face mask if you like, but it is not really any protection. So what changed? We now have government edicts that masks must be worn on public transport and on aircraft. But our one source of truth previously told us they were pointless. Who are we to believe? The Dr Ashley Bloomfield who said that? Or the Dr Ashley Bloomfield who now does modelling of his homemade masks from the same podium he previously said masks were useless? This is a homemade mask, um, uh, which uh, there are various patterns for on the on the uh, uh, on the internet or elsewhere. Um, I didn't make this myself. It was um, make ma- it, Dr. Uh, uh, who did make this. Um, it was the uh, mother of one of my son's friends, so he kindly made that for me. I've also had a lovely one sent by a member of the public, uh, which has got the TARDIS on it, um, uh, which is nice. Uh, so yes, homemade masks. These can be washed and reused. Um, and face covering, it can be a a scarf or a bandana in the meantime. Uh, The important thing is how you use it, of course, and being careful with hand hygiene. I I didn't bring mine down uh, as Dr Bloomfield did, so unfortunately I can't show you. I don't. Can you demonstrate? Uh, This is always a little dangerous uh, to do, of course, in front of a a live TV audience. Uh, That's exactly right. So uh, the important thing here is to, of course, hold the elastic uh, at the ends and and keep the the hands away from the, the mouth and face. It goes here over the over the years, in my case, not too difficult to do. The one problem I do have is my glasses do fog up a bit, you will notice, uh, and I'll take that off. Apparently, you can use sellotape across the top just to help prevent that. Is it any wonder that people conf- were confused when even the health officials charged with keeping us safe are talking out of both sides of their mouths? And then we have our ninny of a prime minister posting videos on Instagram about her mask-making abilities. But back in May, we were told a review of science and policy around face masks during COVID-19 was commissioned by the ministry's chief science advisor, Dr Ian Town, and that review found face masks were not as effective as hand washing or social distancing, but could not find any data to quantify risk reduction. The same article from May quotes Dr Ashley Bloomfield as saying, The physical properties of a cloth mask, reuse, the frequency and effectiveness of cleaning, and increased moisture retention may potentially increase the infection risk. The effectiveness of public mask wearing was speculative and would probably intercept the transmission link, the report said. Cloth masks may be cost-effective, but there is no clinical evidence in the COVID-19 context to suggest that they are ineffective as source control. The rates of all infection outcomes were highest in the cloth mask arm. The results of the mask review in May cautioned against the use of cloth masks. So why the vault face? Why is Dr Ashley Bloomfield now showing and telling everyone to wear a mask when his own ministry that he heads up says there's no clinical evidence to suggest they are effective. And why is our Prime Minister showing how and encouraging people to make their own cloth masks when the Ministry of Health says the rates of infection out- outcome are highest with cloth masks? Back in March, the Prime Minister was nattering with nano girl Michelle Dickinson and Dr Julia Gerard about masks. The touching the face message I'm hearing coming through a yeah. lot. That's actually easier said than done. So... Uh, in those scenarios, I mean, I, I hear, I see people wearing masks. Your views on masks, because a lot of people are going out, buying up their hand sanitizer, buying masks, and also toilet paper. But is there any <laughs> reason why masks are something that people should be using? So for the general public, if you don't have symptoms, there's no need to wear a mask. The thing is, the virus can still get in through your eyes. So if somebody's going to sneeze on you, the mask will only protect your nose. It won't protect your eyes. The people who will need to be wearing masks right now is if you are symptomatic, if you have symptoms, if you're sneezy, wear a mask because 
we know that the particles that you sneeze out could possibly infect people. So what that does is keeps those particles inside your mask. You can't reinfect yourself. And so masks are really good for that. Masks can be good because they make you aware of your face. Mm. And so they stop you touching your face. But the best thing to do is just train yourself to put your hands down and not actually touch your face. You don't need to be wearing a mask all the time unless you are symptomatic, you have symptoms. And so there's, um, there's a lot of people buying them thinking they're being protected. But actually, it's about having good hygiene and keeping your distance. What makes me interested is that all this information is out there. It's freely available on the internet, and yet it seems to have escaped the collective memory of all our media and even the people who are now promoting mask wear when they previously said it wasn't necessary. Is it any wonder that people's trust in the government is falling dramatically? And when you hear news reports that the police, instead of catching criminals, are going to be enforcing mandatory mask wearing on public transport, then you have to wonder if we really have lost the plot. Have we slipped so far down the slippery slope to totalitarianism that we now require our police to monitor if people are wearing masks or not? There is something interesting happening, probably as a result of the hapless act antics at the border. People are losing trust in the Prime Minister and her government. Worse still, for them, is they are prepared to say so very loudly. People are no longer afraid of any backlash from unhinged Jacinda maniacs. We saw an article from Polly Gillespie, then one from Heather de Plessis Allen. Mike Hosking has always had a healthy, healthy dose of scepticism, but when former broadcasters like Willie Jackson, now a Labour minister, leap to the defence of Jacinda Ardern, then you know they're losing the PR battle. An avalanche starts with a few snowballs, and there are more than a few in play right now. Now, you have lifelong Labour voting luminaries like Brian Edwards talking about voting for National. Something is going on out there, and it doesn't appear to be good for the Labour Party. Heather de Plessis Allen's article outlines a loss of trust. She doesn't believe the Prime Minister or indeed any other minister when they make their 1pm proclamations. Chris Hipkins kind of ruined it for them by hectoring, badgering and lecturing everyone that they were the one source of truth. That what was said at the 1pm press conference was the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. The same day he said that, there were multiple falsehoods delivered and since then many more are being called out. The media are no longer compliant and during Thursday's presser, they were incredulous at the claims being made, especially about the app that bugger all use. We heard in the previous segment the vault face of Ashley Bloomfield over masks. And that's a good case about the only source of truth. Dr. Bloomfield is on record as saying masks were useless at a 1pm press conference. That was supposed to be the one source of truth, that masks were useless. Now he models putting them on and waxes lyrical about the t same time slots about how masks are important. Which Dr. Bloomfield do we believe? The mixed messages are just part of the problem. The big promises made by Labour at the last election have failed to materialise. They've either been abject failures like Kiwi Build, or they haven't even started like light rail to Auckland Airport or rapid rail between Hamilton and Auckland. The year of delivery produced only stillborn or aborted projects. The Prime Minister is, people are finding out, not, is nothing short of a windbag with a selection of catchy but increasingly naff and grating slogans. When you lose the trust of the people, it is very hard to get it back. And when that trust involves their health and financial well-being, then you are just marking time until being booted from office. When people realise that they've been lied to, that it actually wasn't all good, and that they actually didn't have our backs, that everything they touch is turns to dung, then people get angry. The, the fact that people are now prepared to say out loud what they were previously only thinking shows how fast the mask has slipped. Platitudes, slogans, hugs and feels aren't going to cut it any longer. Excuses are now being made, the wrong people being blamed. Kiwis are pretty forgiving. The Prime Minister should have apologised for the stuff-ups at the border, and she should have asked for forgiveness. And you know what? 
People would have forgiven her. They would have said she was only doing her best. But we didn't get that. Instead, we had the Prime Minister and her ministers deny they were responsible, then blame health officials, then a call store company. Now they're playing a metaphorical Sergeant Schultz saying that they don't know how the Chinese plague got back in. Well, when you don't test people at day three after saying they would be, when you let hundreds slip through the border untested, and when you try to make excuses and lie, then it sort of becomes really apparent that it is actually your problem. The team of five million weren't in charge of the border. They were. The team of five million weren't in charge of testing. They were. The team of five million weren't in charge of flu vaccines. They were. The team of five million weren't in charge of PPE. They were. Are you seeing a pattern here? There is no team of five million. There are just a bunch of people trying to survive as their businesses and jobs disappear through no fault of their own. And how large is the farce at the border? They didn't even keep basic stats. They had to go away and manufacture them. Here they are. The number of returnees into New Zealand from August 1 to August 20 was 7,222. The number of returnees who arrived from August the 1st to August the 20th who have received at least one test is 7,043. Oh dear, a gap. Percentage of returnees who arrived from August 1 to August 20 and received at least one test was 97.5%. Returnees who arrived between August 1 and August 20 and no da testing data is recorded, 179. So 179 people were not tested. That's a fail. And that's just 20 days. The testing regime was supposed to be in place from June 23 when the Prime Minister told the House that everyone coming through the border would be tested twice. Chris Hipkins has said that was never the plan, but the Prime Minister who told us all that she didn't lie said otherwise. It's in the Hansard. Have a listen. Uh, to the Prime Minister, does she stand by her statement, and I quote, we had an expectation that testing was happening in day three and day 12 at the moment we went into alert level one, end quote. And if so, on what factual basis was that expectation formed? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, at the beginning of June, my office sought to confirm the testing that was taking place at alert level one, including high risk areas. On 5 June, the Ministry of Health emailed a response stating, quote, testing of people entering New Zealand will commence in the week of 8 June 2020. These people will be tested at day 3 and day 12 of their stay in the managed isolation facilities. Approximately 3,000 tests will be undertaken of uh, these people, including those who, have already, who are already in the facility, end quote. On 8 June, the same advice was provided to Cabinet in an update from the Ministry of Health. On 9 June, the Ministry of Health released a press release which stated, quote, from today, everyone in managed isolation will be tested twice for COVID-19 and will require a negative test before they leave. Those in quarantine were already being tested as they had shown prior symptoms, end quote. There's no wriggle room there. She either lied to us then or she's lying to us now. If they can't even tell the truth about what they promised us previously, then who the Duplessis Allen was right when she said we can no longer trust the Prime Minister or her government. When trust is lost, then so too is the government. If we no longer trust them, then we have options. And fortunately, the election is just six weeks away. <laughs> is filled with joy and cheer what a magical time of year howdy ho it's weasel stomping day put your viking helmet on spread that mayonnaise on the lawn don't you know it's weasel stomping day all the little girls and boys love that wonderful crunching noise you'll know what this day's about when you stop a weasel's guts right out so come along and have a laugh snap their weasel he's fine It 
was a plan hatched to fund a school that was so cunning that you could put a tail on it and call it a weasel. Unfortunately, the brilliant strategist who hatched this plan and promoted it forgot that his own party has a policy opposing the funding of private schools and indeed any subsidies to private schools. No matter, advocate and push for over $11 million of state money to find a private school that charges $24,000 per annum for liberal elite Kiwi students and $46,000 per annum for their woke international counterparts. It certainly helped it was called a green school and it was a shovel-ready project. But this week's political weasel James Shaw got caught out and now he's sorry for signing off on it. He will of course expect that being a green, he is covered by both his shield of sanctimony and a cloak of hypocrisy. No doubt he would also choke on his Roma Cruft Weaselito, so I think I'll just keep this one in the humidor. Meanwhile, the Womble School in Taranaki must surely be laughing as they get the cash and their buildings. Other schools are not impressed with another Taranaki school sending Minister of Education an invoice for $26.9 million in an attempt to get equal treatment for their students. I suppose we should be grateful that this weasel apologised, but one suspects the apology would be about as sincere as that from the drunk Father Jack in the hit TV show Father Ted. I'm so, so sorry. Light bulbs and shower heads cost Clark the 2008 election. You'll remember that the government was going to force us all to change to government prescribed light bulbs and also we were going to have to install dribbly shower heads in order to preserve water and energy. Something we have bundles of in this country. It was rightly seen as overzealous and nanny statism and it cost Helen Clark the 2008 election as Kiwi voters had after nine long years tired of Auntie Helen and her doctrinaire approach to politics. Now Jacinda Ardern's government is heading down that same path by deciding to impose on Kiwi drivers fines for exceeding the speed limit by just one kilometre per hour. Will gouging motorists for doing one kilometre over the speed limit be Jacinda Ardern's light bulb and showerhead issue? This is nothing short of a naked revenue grab that has nothing to do with road safety. People should not get fined because they were driving at 51 km per hour instead of 50 km per hour. It is in fact quite difficult to keep a constant speed without cruise control, so you often have your speed move around by a few kilometres per hour. And then there are variables like tyre diameter and speedo instrument accuracy. This is exactly why you have a tolerance. If there is no tolerance, then the only way to be safe is to probably aim to drive 5 kilometres an hour under the speed limit, and that is just going to cause backlogs. When the tickets start flowing, the outrage will build, and this will become a light bulb and showerhead issue for this government. The government is losing the plot and the narrative. The new outbreak in Auckland has exposed their grandiose claims as being nothing but flannel and slogans. Aucklanders are over it. Voters are over it. The actions and deeds of this government haven't matched their slogans and statements. And instead of apologising to forgiving and understanding voters for their cock-ups, they've instead doubled down and resorted to more slogans. While they've been sloganeering, our businesses and jobs have been flushed away. At some point the subsidies will cease and then the jobs and businesses will cease too. With the big push for masks now, in stark contrast to previous advice, It seems that the only tools the government have in their toolkit are masks and lockdowns. If the goal is to eliminate the virus, mass masking and lockdown is all they have. And how many viruses have been eradicated worldwide? Any clues? The answer is one. Smallpox. And it took 50 years to do it. This government thinks we're going to eliminate this virus. The strategy is madness. And so we're going to be softened up even further. Watch them extend masking. They're already talking about that. They're now asking people in Auckland to wear masks whenever going out. That will strengthen. 
eventually they'll mandate it. They did this in Victoria, watch them do it here. Fortunately, media now seem to be onto their bullshit. Hard questions are being asked and they are being called out for their slogans. Will the voters wake up in time and toss these jobs worse from office? We need some competent people in charge, not failed student politicians. They couldn't manage the border, they couldn't manage testing, they couldn't distribute flu vaccines, they couldn't distribute PPE, they couldn't build houses, and they couldn't build a rail line to the airport. Why are we surprised they've stuffed this up too? I'm Cam Slater, and this was Insight Politics. Insight Politics.